college in Boston. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I went there for a year and I dropped out. Um, and and um, after dropping out, I didn't know what to do with my life. And um, around that time in 1991, my uncle and aunt decided to move to California uh, in order to pursue the Cambodian American dream, uh, which was to own a donut shop. And... Uh, to make enough money uh, so that they can send their kids to college. And I went along with them. Um, and, uh, you know, I was there, um, tried to work and helped out at the donut shop. And um, then I work as a janitor. Um, I, um, I, um, I clean people's bathtubs and toilets and offices and so on for, for quite a bit. I'm telling you this long story uh, that's connected to Long Beach, had, and it, it really has to do with, with an important moment in my life, and which was an accident. Um, I decided to go to the library. I, I went to the uh, Dana um, branch of the Long Beach Library, and that was where I discovered literature. That's, that was where I discovered the importance of books and imagination and thinking about my possible selves and what I could do with my life. So, uh, you know, um, so I, I like to read a poem that sort of captures this particular moment, how the library won and how books, literature saved me. Um, so I'll read that. And for today's uh, event, um, you know, I'll read poems from my first three books and maybe talk a little bit about you know, where these poems came from. Um, and that's sort of, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, and if it's a little too long, uh, I'd like Eric to interrupt me and said, uh, well, we're in a quarter of two or quarter of 11 and, uh, and you need some Q&A and I would love to talk and answer any of your questions that you have. Okay, so let me, uh, let's look at the first uh, poem. Um, this is from Gruel. It's on page 72. Um, how everything changed. I was a college dropped out working in Southern California, scrubbing, washing, mopping, emptying trash cans of private homes, synagogue, local schools and offices in the Long Beach zip yard. Nothing backbreaking just losing a couple of hours of sleep each night. One morning, out of boredom, I decided to visit the local library, the kind where old ladies push steel book carts past little children playing, mothers gossiping, the kind where you can disappear quickly into a corner. It was in one such corner, hidden away from the sights and sounds of suburban mothers and their children where I pick a random book off the shelf, a book of poems by that drunken old man, a book filled with social misfits and outcasts, drunks and prostitutes, barflies, cockroaches and vomit. At that moment, I felt my first breath. I was gasping for air. I felt my own sweet suffering in others. Loneliness was extinguished and compassion bloom in my chest. I'm telling you this so that you know in the worst storm of your life, this mad love can hit you, smashing you into a billion pieces, connecting you with everyone and everything. So that, that moment of being awakened by literature, uh, that was the moment that changed my life. And from there, I went back to college. 
first Long Beach City College, then Cal State, then the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Then I got my first job. It was like a winning the lottery as an assistant professor um, at Union College up in Schenectady, New York. Um, I, I do consider myself very lucky, uh, the whole sort of trajectory of it all. Um, and in the process of sort of discovering books, uh, there's this sort of need to tell my own stories. And I didn't know how to do that. So I kept on reading uh, books. And, and in the process of that, I also began to ask my uncles and aunts and uh, grandmother, what life is like for them, okay? Uh, to answer Amber's question, uh, Charles Bukowski was that first reader. And from there, um, he introduced me to other poets and writers and artists and philosophers. And Bukowski's language was simple and accessible um, from the gut, pretty honest stuff. And that was something that I needed uh, at that time. Uh, so I'll, I'll read some more poems from the collection. Uh, this one is about fishing, you know. Uh, I was in Long Beach and uh, uh, at one point I would ride my bike down to the pier and there was you know, people fishing uh, off the Long Beach pier and also, you know, San Pedro. Um, so this poem is, is about fishing and about my uncles and aunts and other immigrants and refugees fishing. And uh, I was always amazed um, uh, their ability to survive um, and to maintain uh, some of the livelihood that they had in Cambodia, okay? Uh, so I'll, I'll, read, I'll read that poem, uh, Fishing for Trey Plateau, um, also from this book, Gruel. Fishing for Trey Plateau. You might have seen them fishing on the shores of the Cape Cod Canal. My uncle in his fisherman's hat, pulling in a one foot scup. My aunt in her pajama like pants, walking backward up the bike path, snapping a line that's gotten stuck between the rocks. My other aunt reeling in a sea bass, her husband by her side erecting. Bikers, jockers, teenagers and their dates, families with their children look curiously on. Or maybe you've seen them lining up all three sides of a pier in Salem, their wrists jerking in a language that bewitches the squids below. They are, they are not the only ones. Other Cambodians and Vietnamese, once enemies, fish side by side on the same American pier. Other immigrants, Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese, speaking languages I can't understand, come together on this spot, sacred rods in hands, beckoning the squid. Or maybe you've seen them under a bridge fishing the Providence River, looking for Trey Plateau, a type of mackerel they used to eat in the refugee camp in Thailand. Thailand. Sometimes my aunts and uncles run into an old friend from those long ago days. They talk about the lack of food, of sneaking out at night to fish, and of running, always running from the Thai police. They exchange phone numbers, share fishing secrets, and set up a time and place where they'll fish together again. When they get home, my aunts gut the fish, clean them, fry them, and put them in the boiling stew of galangal, lemongrass, and kaffir leaves. My uncles and aunts sit in a circle on the floor, eat and tell stories of how this fish got away, or how one of them got caught by the Thai police. No matter how hard they try, they can never understand why my cousin and I ever bother with fishing why we catch and release food as if it's some sport. 
and the difference in generations when it comes to fishing um, there. I think uh, maybe one more poem about my uncles and aunts. Um, you know, when I began to think about my past and my history and my culture and what my uncles and aunts went through, you know, there's a sense of pride, uh, absolutely pride and even love <laughs> for them. Uh, I'm smiling and laughing because uh, you know, as you, as a lot of us know, when you're young, you always butt head with the older generation. But when you reach a certain age, when you start to look back, um, then you realize that uh, you have a certain perspective, uh, you know, the, uh, one that that changed quite a bit. Um, so this one is, uh, and I know Tony G is here, and I don't want to talk too much about my life story. Uh, but I, I do need to provide a little bit of context here and there. Uh, this is about first snow, uh, also from this uh, book, Gruel. First snow. We huddle behind the back door of our sponsor's house. My uncle, the bravest because he spoke a little English, went out. My grandmother, Anne's, and I watched him through the kitchen window. He bent down, reached for the whiteness of this new world, and put some in his mouth. He looked back at us and smiled. We can make snow cones with this. America, the miraculous, our savior, you were the land of dreams then. So this is uh, this next poem is is very important to me. Um, is the only sort of potent memory that I have of my mom, um, and this is one of her and her funeral. Um, and I like to read this poem because it it gives you a sense of of how I became a writer and poet and thinker. Um, or the kind of poet that I am. I'm a, I'm a poet of loss and grief, and I use literature to rebuild what was lost from history, from politics, from migration. And so this is a poem about my memory of my mother and her funeral. Under the tamarind tree, the child sits on the lap of his aunt under the old tamarind tree outside the family home. The tree stands still, quiet, indifferent. The house sways on stilts. Monks in saffron robes and nuns with shaved heads, lips darkened with betel nut stain, sit chanting prayers for the child's mother. Incense perfumes to hot, dry air. There emerges a strange, familiar song between the child and his aunt that day. A distant one, melodic but harsh, as if the strings are drawn too tight. Each time the child hears prayers coming from the house, he cries. Each time he cries, the aunt a girl herself pinches the boy's thigh. In the process of um, John Under the Tamron Tree is from the book Rule, uh, my first book of poems. Uh, in the process of talking to my grandmother, aunts, and it's usually my aunts, my uncles don't talk much about the past. Um, I learn about this kind of stuff. And I also, there's a moment when my aunt asked me, it's like, how did you have that memory? You were so young. You remember that I pinched you and, you know. 
sadness would ensue after that. <laughs> uh, anyway, a couple more poems uh, from the from Gruel. Um, this is uh, called Inheritance, also from uh, Gruel. It's an interesting story, and I was talking to Eric about this earlier, uh, how the older generations don't feel comfortable talking about the painful past, you know, about the Khmer Rouge, and what happens and for us, so a younger generation, I'm considered 1.5 generation, uh, meaning that I came here at a certain age and, you know, not, not young, um, but uh, you know, about eight or nine years old and I grew up here, but uh, we, 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 we are seen as the bridge generation. We serve as a bridge between the first and the second generation uh, of immigrants in this case of Cambodian refugees. Um, the point had to do with, you know, there's a kind of absent, there's a kind of absent and present of that past. And um, you know, the more I discover about this past, the more I feel nothing but pride. Um, and there's nothing to be ashamed of, pride in terms of our ability to survive, my uncles and aunts and grandparents, and to, rebuild their lives and make families. Uh, I, I find that quite impressive. Um, so this is a poem about the Khmer Rouge and, and what that world is like. Uh, and, it, and I call it uh, you know, inheritance. It is our inheritance. It's something that we need to acknowledge, know, accept. Um, and you know, take it as part of our identity, okay? Inheritance. My uncles, aunts, and grandmother all agree. It was a difficult time. People starving. You don't trust the children. You don't trust your neighbors, friends, even your family. But this can't be. It must be something I read, something I taught, Pointing, pointed out in a lecture, maybe discovered in a conversation with a survivor, a man with ashen hair and toothless smile in an apartment complex in Lowell, Massachusetts. These are the images I carry with me, rib cage thin, diarrhea, chicken blindness, dysentery, hands tied behind your back, Legs too weak to crawl, eyes bulging, white with petrification, iris as black as night, wings broken, spirit destroyed. Only paranoia and hunger rule the day. In the night, my mother's body, difficulty with breathing, bones sharp as knives, eternal loneliness, eternal sadness the sour taste of tamarind, mother dead from starvation, her sister, a branch in hand, sharpened by hunger, hunting for lizards, snakes, crickets, for dark green leaves, all black, black pajamas, black hair, black sadness, always night, always cold, cold wind and loneliness, fear whispering wind and unseen eyes, pineapple eyes everywhere and nowhere, strangers, friends, family disappearing without struggle, without a sound. The only evidence is the fear in those trembling, working the fields, lips so dry it hurts when it rains. The corpse is thrown about as if for a group pose in a ditch along the dirt road, plastic bag wrap around the heads, a statement of value of human life unworthy of a single bullet. Dear motto, to kill you is no loss, but what is loss is family, the old way of life, being human. What is gain is a new world order. Monks disrobed, temples destroyed, elders useless. The new temple is a pyramid of human skulls where a boy 
illiterate and verging on puberty, dressed in black pajamas, an AK-47 on his back, a grandma around his neck, guards the entrance. His old family gone, his new family is the organization. His new mother is hate, his new father is Anka. To each everything must be reported, Anka, the figurehead, the godhead, the master of the universe from which to which everything revolves, the giver and taker of life, human or otherwise, the maker of reality. Uh, I like to read uh, the title poem from this book, Gruel. Um, this is a photograph. I don't know if you can see this um, of my parents' wedding. Um, under the Khmer Rouge time, we hid our past. So this photograph was buried. And then somehow, miraculously, um, my uncle or my aunt or my grandmother gave me this photo. You see the duct tape there. I'm not sure why. I think it's because, well, this is an uncle. Um, he was, you know, we try to protect his identity. Um, anyway, uh, enough of that. You, know, you can get a sense of what happened. I'd like to read this maybe final poem, even though I have a lot of poems um, to read from this book. Uh, it's, this one is called Gruel and it's the title poem. Uh, you know, there's something I'd like you to sort of, for those of you who are listening, um, I wouldn't be here reading to you these poems. I wouldn't be here being a poet, uh, being a professor, if I had not helped, um, you know, from guides, uh, strangers and family members. Uh, and really, my sort of concord success is based on the kindness of people. Uh, one of the people is my grandmother. Um, and this poem and this book is dedicated to her. And, um, you know, she passed away before the book came out. So that was one of the big thing that her, the big things that, that got to me. Was, uh, she didn't get a chance to see the fruit of her love. So I'll read this, this, this book here, uh, this, this poem. Uh, there's more to read from, but I think I gotta make sure that we're okay with time. Gruel. We were talking about survival when my uncle told me this. When you were young, we had nothing to eat. Your grandmother saved for you the thickest part of her rice gruel. Tasting that cloudy mixture of salt, water, and grain, you cried out, this is better than beef curry. All my life, I told myself I never knew suffering other under the regime, only love. This is still true. Anyway, I think I messed up with that reading, um, but I think it's fine. Some of the stuff... It's getting to me, so I got to get through some of these poems as quickly as I can. Uh, I'd like to read a couple of poems from the, uh, my second collection. Uh, this collection of poems called And So I Was Blessed is based on my trips to Vietnam. Uh, the first one was to see my father's side of the family. Uh, they are Khmer people from Khmer Krom in the Mekong Delta. It's where I gather stories about my father and his family. Uh, it's also about my trip to Vietnam as a tourist and as a faculty leader for the Vietnam term abroad for Union College and Hobart William Smith. Um, I think I'll read two or three poems from this. Um, the first one, um, uh, 
is this sort of very long poem called Searching for Father in, Com in, Com in Campuchia Crown, uh, uh, the southern part of the Mekong Delta. And uh, let me see here. I think I'll read two sections of it. I'll do my best to read it without choking up. Um, Eleven. Your father, my aunt said, was generous, his heart as big as the sky. She opened wide her arms, her body lean to the weight of memories. He invited friends over, bought them dinners. He was a good big brother. He used to come up behind us, wrap his arms around our shoulders tightly. As she told the story, she wrapped her arms around herself, head tilted, eyes closed, weeping. My uncles sat in their corners, blinking, staring at the chicken pecking the dirt floor. 12. And this is the story that they, um, that they, uh, told me about my father and what he did for me. My father walked up to the Khmer Rouge after, ugh, I gotta read this one now, eh? okay. My father walked up to the Khmer Rouge after they killed the children and opened their stomachs to eat the livers. My father got down on his knees, clapped hands overhead and begged them for a sliver of a victim's liver, so that I would not starve. While everyone was sleeping, my father snuck into the kitchen, stole a branch of coconuts, and buried them in the woods. Each time I cry from hunger, he disappeared into the night, dug up a coconut, gave me the juice to drink, and with dirt encrusted fingers, Spoon out the flesh for me, his only child. So when I was doing the uh, term abroad in Vietnam, it was very painful. It was the first time I, uh, you know, I became a father um, to to. You know, to this beautiful daughter who is now seven years old. Um, so you know, the poem is about me leading this term abroad program uh, of me as a son uh, visiting his father's village, meeting uh, his father's um, family for the first time. But it's also me being a father, missing my own daughter as I was in Vietnam for Three, four months, uh, that's quite a, a long time. So there are some poems about my daughter in this collection. Song for Stella. My wife is in her third trimester. This is when every position is uncomfortable, sitting, standing, lying sideways or on her back. She finds herself out of breath walking up a few steps of stairs. At night, I pick up my guitar, sit in front of the computer, turn to web pages with lyrics and chords. I strum, my wife sings to our unborn daughter. But I'm, not a, but I'm not a good keeper of time. I switch chords too soon or too late. And my wife already annoyed with the discomfort of sitting glares. She likes order, structure, constancy. She endures my inconsistency. Closing her eyes, she focuses only on our daughter, who at first breath will recognize our sounds. I might be in trouble with reading that one about my wife. So we'll see if she checks out this video. Maybe, uh, ooh, maybe 
three more poems just because of time, okay? Uh, yeah, this is third book of poems. Uh, it's called The Doctor Will Fix It. This is actually my daughter dressed up as a doctor. Uh, and uh, having children uh, for me is a good way to heal myself. Um, in the act of caring and loving my children. I don't know what psychologists, how they would analyze or talked about this, but it's a good way for me somehow to give my kids what I didn't have. Um, and that way is somehow healing. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> it's just true to me. Uh, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll read a couple of poems uh, from this book. It's all about my daughter. And my daughter, you know, it was written around 2017, 2018, um, you know, when Trump came, uh, uh, when Trump became president. And there's a lot of stuff that deals with uh, gender, with immigration, with uh, uh, sort of current uh, that climate um, the current uh, the political culture climate at that particular time uh, um, anyway so I'll read I'll read some of these poems here moon in Khmer you are light when the sun is punched out and darkness reigns you are the antidote to what came before Black blood, black heart, hands tied, kneeling before a ditch of human bones. Your laughter pierces the silence of night that bore witness to the one's blood-soaked land. Your existence is resistant to the genocide that orphaned your father and drove his family out of the homeland. You are love against the hate of the Khmer Rouge this is the meaning of your name, Janda. This is how to defeat Pol Pot. And I, I, I do believe in that too, this idea that, uh, you know, because the Khmer Rouge was threatened by love, by family love, um, as they rebuilt a new society in a new year called Year Zero. So for me to be able to have family, to have kids, um, it's, it's a kind of resistance. Uh, it's a kind of uh, you know, um, way to defeat the Khmer Rouge, okay? A lot of stuff I could read from here. Let me just go one more poem and then I have to do Q and A, okay? Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Uh, I really don't know how old I am. Um, when we came to America, my uncle uh, in Thailand, uh, we were refugees and he created like, sort of birthday, birth dates for all of us. Uh, and we kind of you know, he put all of us close in age, cousins and uncles and so on, so that we can be one big family in the refugee application. Um, you know, so when my wife began to celebrate my birthday for our daughter's sake, I always feel a little weird because it's not really my birthday. Um, and this is a poem about that, and it's the last poem because I want to hear your questions. On the anniversary of my fake birthday, when the Khmer Rouge put a plastic bag on the neighbor's head, kicked and dragged him away, his laugh breath extinguished, his broken body thrown in a ditch with other corpses, some with blood still warm and others decomposed in the hot sun. Your birthday was the least of anyone's concerns. 
What concerns your uncle, aunts, and grandparents was survival, which meant catching and killing a black snake to supplement the meager ration of, ration of rice, water, and morning glories they call lunch and dinner. What was glorious was hiding the food to share later in the dark with family. Logie blowing on the embers to cook the snake's chewy meat. Your uncles and aunts looked on quietly like hungry ghosts. Your birthday was the least of anyone's concern. What concerned your uncle at the refugee camp was making sure no one got separated. Your birthday was invented to fit the refugee story. A paper family glued together, a neighbor turned into an uncle, and the neighbor's daughter became a sister. When you have a family of your own 30 years later, your five-year-old daughter can't go to sleep on the night before your birthday. It reminds you the next morning of the celebration to enjoy. She squeals in sweet delight when she sees the cake with my little pony candle she and her mom have picked out and decorated. You ask her to help you blow out the candles and you eat the triple chocolate cake that your daughter loves. All you ever want on this day is to see her radiate. You play along this birthday game because you want her to have a normal life. Anyway, I don't think I'm going to finish reading that one. Let's do some questions. I think that's it for my reading. Thank you so much, Mr. Tuan. Um, you know, just hearing you read your poems, it's just so beautiful and so captivating. And I know you talked about this earlier, um, but we really feel your, you know, your emotion as you're reading your experience. And I do think as hard as it is, you know, just telling your story is so important um, to just sort of preserve the history and um, and it really is reflected in your in your stories. And I just want to thank you so much for for sharing with us. Um, it means so much and it's so brave and inspiring that you do that. Um, and, and again, just thank you so much. Um, I do want to say really quickly um, that we do have, um, if you haven't picked up a copy of Mr. Tuan's books, we do have a copy of Gruel. And so I was blessed in our Long Beach collection. Every branch should have a copy. So you're more than welcome to check out a copy. Um, and again, thank you to Alex Pham, who's in um, the chat uh, for helping put this together and, and sending over the, the books. They've all been processed and we do have a copy. So thank you so much. And, um, and definitely, you know, if you haven't had a chance to pick them up and read, uh, they're just they're just wonderful reads and um we're also recording the session so if there's anything that we might have missed or you might have missed um it's going to be uploaded into our youtube channel so we can always go back and refer to so i just wanted to make sure to put that out there before you know forgetting um but i do want to ask i'm going to go ahead and start with um, if you don't mind the first question um there is a poem it's a shorter poem and it's on page 43 of gruel and you and i mr Tuan, we were talking about it earlier um, it's called Saturday Morning in Melbourne, Massachusetts, 1986. And if you don't mind, if I read just, it's a, it's a short poem. So yep. um, it's Saturday morning, grocery shopping at the only Asian market in the city, putting back fish sauce and soy sauce, picking up milk, bread, and cereal. I told grandma to be quiet because Stephanie and her mother were there too. And I couldn't help but notice um, the word only sort of being emphasized when referring to, you know, only Asian market. And I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about the importance of diversity and how that's reflected in the importance of having diversity more, you know, uh, businesses for, for our community and, and what that means to you. Absolutely. Um, you know, um, when I, when I was young growing up in the East Coast in the 1980s, uh, there was a lack of diversity. Um, as a result, when there, you don't see people who look like you, not, you know, not only on TV and movies, but at school, uh, you feel undervalued or not valued. Uh, you feel alone and embarrassed and ashamed. And the poem ends with, you know, this, uh, with the speaker in the poem, uh, feeling very embarrassed of eating Asian food. 
uh, in this case, uh, represented in the, the fish sauce. Um, and, uh, and just because he saw Stephanie, her mom being there, he was embarrassed of what he eats. He was probably embarrassed of his own grandmother. Um, you know, when I, when I came to Long Beach, California in the early 90s, 91, what was amazing about that experience was it was so diverse in people, in cultures, in food, in language. And uh, I didn't feel different. I felt like finally I was at home. And that was very special. And Long Beach, you know, you know, I started this reading with that poem about discovering Bukowski in our library. Um, but Long Beach was, it's really about my birth, my rebirth. And Long Beach, you know, was the place where I had my first breath as someone who feels and could express himself and someone who feels at home. Uh, so it is important in terms of this kind of events. And this is why I, I, you know, I, I, I do this. And I asked you know, Alexin to give all my books to the libraries in Long Beach and LA. I want those kids who had my, you know, history or kids who just feel like they're different to pick up these books and say, oh my goodness, his name looks familiar, or I could relate to this story. And to see the possibilities of themselves and what they can do with, with their lives. And this is really what, what it's about for me. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, if there's a kid in Lowell, in Revere, in Malden, in Long Beach, in LA, if you pick up this book or something of mine and they're moved by it and they said, I don't have to do this or do that. I could be something else. Then that's success for me as a writer. <laughs> I'm, I'll be very happy with that. Pretty, pretty much so. I don't know if that answers your question there, Eric, uh, oh, yes. but diversity in a very personal sort of level. That's what it means to me. I think that's, yeah, no, that definitely answers it 100%, you know, to see yourself in, you know, in the community and to, to have, it feels like a sense of home. And, um, and, I, and I hear that just hearing you talk, it's so genuine. And, um, and thank you again, that, that, that answers the question. And also you were talking about family and in your poems, there's a lot of reference to, you know, your, your parents and your grandma and even your cousins, your cousin's parents um, in the, le for example, in the poem Lessons with Cousins, where you talk about, you know, teaching them to be strong because it's a cruel world, you know, and I, I, I see that, you know, I think that's, that's so important. And I, and I, I can see the longing though, even though there was sort of a, you know, like arguments at a young age. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, you grow to appreciate that because they're your family at the end of the day. Absolutely, absolutely. And my definition of strength changes. Uh, now strength has to do with, you know, with love and tenderness and, uh, you know, giving yourself. Um, um, it's, it, it has shifted. Uh, and that was a funny poem, uh, you know, lessons, uh, because when you grew up in the East Coast at that time, uh, it was about survival and survival is not through arts and literature and kindness, but through kind of physical toughness. <laughs> it was tough. It was tough. Yeah. And Alex also he survived. My, my cousin survived and he's fine. He's I'm, I'm happy with, <laughs> with, with, with all of them. You know, they, yeah. they did well for themselves. And yeah. This, awesome. this room here is one of their, you know, it's my cousin's room. They loaned me this room so I can have a quiet time to read and, mm -hmm. and have this kind of conversation. Now, again, going back to, and this will be my last question before we open up, because I, I definitely want to, um, you know, now have you, telling this, your, your story, obviously, it's it's very raw and emotional. Um, have you, have, by any member of your family, before feeling ready to share your story, have you received any sort of, like, pushback from any family members? Like, well, maybe this is not a good time. I mean, has, has that ever come up? No, when I, when this book came out, um, I gave each uncle and aunt a copy. Mm -hmm. And when I visited them, I noticed the book has not been open. 
<laughs> and I don't blame them. I don't blame them. Number one, English isn't their first language. And then two is, you know, they're busy with work and taking care of their own families, you know. Um, and I think now my aunt, um, my aunt is the sister who took care of my mom uh, before she passed away. I think she's very proud. Um, I have a novel that's based on my life coming, uh, you know, coming out. And she's always asking, when is the novel coming out? When is the novel coming out? Um, but in terms of like, you know, writing and sharing on a public forum and, you know, um, in, in books and in, in journals, articles and so on, uh, stories and poems about real people, you know, I think the, the person that I sort of talk to the most is my wife. Um, I have to, I have to get it clear by her if it's a poem about her. Um, you know, uh, and that's that's really important. Uh, you know, I also asked my aunts, uh, uh, not really my uncle. We don't have that kind of conversation, that kind of relationship. But I, I you know, I, I asked my aunts uh, how she feels about you know, this sort of thing. I think I think they're happy, uh, and I think that that's a big a big relief. Um, and uh, you know, Eric, do you, I don't know if you remember reading the poem. Um, uh, uh, um, let me see. Um, this what we talked. No, I forgot the name of the poem, but this about uh, it might be an invitation. Um, about uh, you know, in group the, the ethics, the ethics of uh, of sharing personal stories. Oh yes, uh, um, um, I think it deals with that a little bit in gruel um, there. Yeah. yeah, but I, I think overall, my my especially my aunts, I think they're 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 pretty happy and pleased and excited. But I know that you know, some of them don't read, and that's part of that. You know, yeah, who they are and part of their culture, uh, not their Cambodian culture, but in terms of who they are, where they came from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as as immigrants and refugees, um, and uh, you know, I'm I think I see my my myself as a uh, you know, I write out of love. <laughs> I, I I don't write out of anger or you know sense of justice, but a kind of admiration for the elders who came before me. I I hope the poems sort of exude that that there's no sort of you know you know uh, what happened to me when I was young was was awful and you didn't do what you're supposed to do. Nothing like that. It was out of admiration and love for them. Yeah, and that's definitely reflected throughout the poems. Um, yeah, no, it's 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 just beautiful to read. And um, and now I want to see if anybody else has any any questions. We'd love to open the floor um, for an invite for questions. Um, you can either, if you'd like, to raise your hand, or you're welcome to type it in the chat box as well. Um, and I'll check the um, the chat to see if I see any hands up. I think I see Nancy's hand. Nancy. Yeah, I, it's interesting. You know, I think, um, I guess kind of two questions. It's, first of all, I just, I love the work. I have all the books. I highly recommend them. Um, it's so moving. Um, just that juxtaposition of the horror of the past and then the love and hope going forward is so inspirational. And I imagine, you know, your audience really relates to the trauma but as a non, you know, someone who didn't have that trauma, I just still find it very connecting to the capacity of people to survive and to thrive. So it's very powerful, you know, to everybody. <laughs> and I wonder if you do find it easy to connect to some of your students who have had trauma. Do you feel like there's a, an easier connection there and support that's also gratifying maybe? Yeah, uh, you know, the, the, the first poem that I read, sort of my understanding of literature is, is one that has to do with empathy and compassion. Um, and, uh, you know, this, well, we, all, we all go through these difficulties in life. Um, that's just the way it is. 
And right mm -hmm. now, my students, and as a parent, I shifted my perspective how to teach. I kind of see my students as like someone else's kids. Does that make sense, Nancy? Mm -hmm. It was just like I wanted to 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 treat mm -hmm. them well the way I would want my kids to be treated by their teachers. Mm -hmm. That that's that's one. And two, it's a tough, it's a tough world right now with the pandemic, with the economy. So I I I, I do what I can with you know my attempt to be generous and kind when I when I when I teach. Uh, and I wanted to bring out issues that are relatable to them. Uh, and on that, that sort of, yeah, on, on that kind of level. And it's been, it's been a pleasure. It's, I've been lucked out. I've lucked out. You know, Nancy uh, is uh, an alumna from Union College. And this is where <laughs> I, this is how we get connected. So it's, it's, and Nancy is also a wonderful poet. Uh, her book is coming out, <laughs> is it this summer? Um, um, next week. I think. Oh my goodness! Can you send that link? I know. I will. I'll. Oh, I'll be. I'll be. I'll be, I'll be talking. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. I'd love yeah. to get a copy too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. Or leave where yeah. We can no, it. it's great. I we kind of connected through the poetry world, but I noticed his connection to Union College, and we've also had a chance to actually meet in person when I was traveling. I'm from LA. So it's just been really exciting time and, and just a discovery. And I also imagine the students as kind of learning about something so firsthand that it's really impactful, you know. So I'm very plugged in. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And we do have a question from Robbie. Robbie, did you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Yes, but I see that someone else had a question first. And that was John Hicks. Oh, John. Yes. John, you're welcome to um, unmute yourself or if you want to write the question in the chat box, no problem. I'm doing a poem right now about adapting. What uh, do, you, do you consider to be the hardest thing about adapting to your new life when you had to come here? And I, I have a very kind of different journey than maybe some immigrants and refugees. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I think for me, uh, being an orphan was the most difficult thing um, uh, growing up. Um, and this has nothing to do with sort of, you know, American culture or Cambodian culture. Uh, it had to do with you know, growing up and seeing my uncles and aunts and with their kids, um, yeah. And that was tough um, to be an outsider in my own family. Uh, and that might be the toughest um, there. The language barrier, I, I don't think that was a big thing. Uh, eventually kids adapt and you pick up the language, um, you know, but the different cultures was very difficult um, in terms of, you know, you have these sort of what your uncles and aunts and grandparents expect you to, to be and what the American culture and American kids expect you to be in terms of what is normal. I think that was a big one too. Uh, but being an orphan is really up there uh, in terms of, you know, uh, the the difficulty of of going through it all um, and the second is that you know the idea of you know your parents your uncles and aunts they, they want you to, to succeed and one way to succeed is to you know listen and respect your elders and authority figures and um become a doctor engineer or a scientist or whatever all that crap i mean <laughs> it's not that crap but it's very painful and i said that crowd because it's an emotional kind of you know baggage for me and i didn't want any of that i before that i just wanted to understand where i came from and why we're here it's like you know i want to know what happened um so that was a big that was a that was a big one uh, uh, for them is you know we don't talk about it because but it does leak through you know at the you remember that poem about fishing and how they talked about the things and it just leaks through them with food and, and drinks and you can hear remnants of what happened or the gruel poem 
you know, while cleaning up after a barbecue party, they start talking about my grandmother. <laughs> it leaks through, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not full. So you have to, you have to pick up these pieces and piece them together to create a narrative. Uh, but they want you to, you know, this is just me and my sort of personal experience. I don't know what other people's experiences are, but focus on the present and, and, and be successful uh, in the more, in the most stereotypical manner, you know, doctors and your lawyers and so on, but don't think about the past. But for me, I just, I needed that to understand myself. Uh, so being an orphan and then that, that culture, the two different cultures, yeah. Not even, it's just, yeah, it's just me needing, needing to know. I don't know if that answered your question, but there are at least two things there that were pretty important for me. That was, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Robbie. Robbie, you have a question? Thank you, John. Well, yeah, it's kind of a big issue. Um, I see that even now when you've, written and rewritten and published these poems and put them together into a book it's really hard for you to deal with what they bring up in you so did you you know as someone who has written and writes personal trauma poems and has suffered PTSD uh, in response to writing them I wondered whether you had to deal with any big upcropping of that, of those feelings, having written those poems and gone over these things in your mind. I think, I think the emotions uh, that, that are not controllable um, after writing the poems, and you know, so you you go through this process of like, you know, weeping and 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 and, and heavy sadness, and and then afterward feeling good about it in terms of there's a kind of a burden that's been released. Uh, so that's like really private, like you know, um, you know, writing that writing the poems and and and, and going through that. And editing is easier, but as you can see uh, with today's reading. I don't know when the moment I'm gonna kind of break down. Um, you know, usually it's about my grandmother or my mom or my dad, but this time it's about my daughter and I had no sort of control over that. Um, there's two, three lines that I didn't finish in that poem. And I think it's available in the, um, what's the name of the Journal of American Poetry or something like that. Um, it's, it's, it's there if you're interested in finishing that poem, but I just couldn't do it, you know? Um, um, so I, I do go through uh, you know, this process of not being able to control my emotions uh, because they came from real places, these poems, these stories. Um, and, and I, it's not like, I don't, you know, it's not performance. I, I wish it was because that would have been easier for me. Like I know when, when the stuff come out. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but I, I think, and I hope, like for today's reading, I think one of the big things that I went to sort of talked about is not only the issue of diversity, but the importance of of libraries and books. How it, it they did save me. They did save me, changed my life around. I went back to college. I got all my degrees. You know, it changed me, and that's why when when, when Alexis sort of contacted Eric is. Uh, I don't want any money. Just donate the money to the Cambodian uh, Association in Long Beach. Now, I just, I just wanted to share this an important story. We, we, we don't value the library. We don't value this, you know, literature and arts that we, that we should. We should, because this is this thing that happened to me, and and I'll, I'll do this whenever I have a chance to do this. I, you know, to bring this message to the public, how important it is. So you know, thank you, Eric, and thank you to that Dana Branch Public Library up in, um, in North Long Beach, um, uh, uh, East Market Street. <laughs> you know, I remember that library. And I remember downtown, downtown Long Beach Library too. 
and I've looked, uh, and I've looked at the, 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 the website. My God, the building is so beautiful. <laughs> the new building structure is, is quite gorgeous. I didn't even recognize it. But the point is the library has been an important part of my life. I've written poems about it, how it changed me. And this is just one of the poems. Awesome. And, um, and Alex has a, uh, thank you, Mr. Tuan. And uh, thank you for your question, Robbie. And um, Alex has a question now. Hello, everyone. First of all, let me just give a shout out to Joanna Belfer. She is an amazing person, also um, book owner of Bel Canto Books. She's the one who actually connected Eric um, to me because she and I had worked on previous projects and I know her. Um, so that's how this all came about. So my question, um, BK, is I remember when I was reading the book, one of the things that really was a factor that stood out for me because um, I was a child when we came here as immigrant, so I don't know the history of my own country, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that um, here in the West, we tend to only focus on, you know, the Great World War II and the Holocaust and all the atrocities. But I feel like there were a lot of atrocities, you know, and genocides and whatnot in Asia. And so I, feel, I wonder to what extent, um, I'm not sure if this is the right way to phrase it, but like, how we can share more of this information, no matter how gruesome and cruel it may be. Because I, I feel like, why haven't we learned the horrors of war so that we don't have any more wars? And there's always these excuses, you know, like I know for a long time, the Armenian people, and I have friends who are Armenian, um, they, the genocide of the Armenians were not recognized. And it still isn't recognized by the UN um, because of Turkey and this taboo. So I feel like the same thing with Cambodia, with Vietnam, even with China, I've read some account where during the revolution, there were atrocities similar to this that were committed. And it was a way to control people, um, this fear and make them give up. And I think, you know, these types of poems, no matter how difficult and challenging they may be for the poet to write, I think that sort of firsthand eyewitness testimony gives so much power and so much authenticity to um, the readers, but also hopefully as a reminder, as, as a history um, that we don't see in history, if that makes sense. So I wonder in your memoir that you're writing, to what extent that, you know, you discuss these sort of things. Um, can you remind me the, the question again? I'm still trying to grapple. Cool. The, the poem that you were reading about, you know, your father and how he approached the, the Khmer and, you know, made that horrible um, decision to ask for, you know, the liver of a, one of the murdered child. And so I feel like those type of atrocities, it tends to be ignored, especially when it's in the South or in Asia. And we only look at the effects of the Great War of World War II and, and the Holocaust. And I, these are some of the lessons that we need to remember in the history books. But they tend to be forgotten because if somehow, you know, I feel like Asia, we're just, they just don't look at these things. Yeah, yeah. Then you write about it and you try to bring the history. I think that's the, you know, the other sort of aim uh, in terms of writing. Um, you know, because I, I do want um, you know, Cambodian kids, children, uh, to be informed and aware uh, of, of, of our history. Um, and in the process of thinking about writing children's book for my kids in terms of you know, wanting them to know about our culture and custom, not just the, uh, the, the genocide uh, there. Um, and um, you know, I think I, I've looked at it and I think, for, at least for me to think about is the sort of the community that we're in you know, I think Long Beach, this, this, this is good. This is very good for the Kamaya community there uh, and serving the community, serving the students, the children, the families there. Um, so I, I think of it that way in terms of, uh, you know, um, of, of like the local communities and, and, and uh, you know, the kind of stories that would serve them. Um, uh, but I, but you're right though, there is a sense of, um, a kind of monolithic uh, narrative of 
you know, of what is, you know, what we, um, you know, what is on the canon or what is on the, the, the syllabus uh, for this kind of literature. And it is excluded. It is excluded. Uh, you know, when we talk about, you know, we, we you know, we teach a, a course on the Vietnam War. I think we, you know, we talked about, you know, the, the Vietnamese perspective, the North, the South, the refugees, the villagers. Uh, and, uh, you know, with a 10 week term at Union, it's hard for me to bring in the Cambodian and the Laotian and the Hmong. But that's also part of that story is, is connected uh, there. Um, you know, um, but I think, yeah, I think our, our job is to, uh, to look around us and see what's needed. And, um, you know, and um, yeah, with, with Union, you know, we don't have a lot of uh, Southeast Asian students. So I'm sort of trying to, to, to bring in, and this is Nancy's earlier question, to bring in, um, you know, stories about and, and by uh, Asian and Asian American writers and poets uh, to um, the students there. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm answering your question uh, so directly, but at least for me to think about the community and 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 who we're serving, uh, because you know, yeah, Long Beach is, is a great example of that. Lowell is the same thing. Lowell is beautiful in terms of you know the kind of resources that are available to serve uh, the Khmer community there. Uh, and so on. Uh, anyway, I'm I'm rambling. Um, I, I hope that somewhat answer your question um, uh, a little bit, Alex. That's a very difficult question for me to think about and, and you know grapple my sort of. Uh, but anyway, uh, okay. Um, Thank you guys so much. We did have a question from Chan also. Okay. Um, okay, Chan. Hello, uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry for the um, camera doesn't work because I just have the eye surgery and I could not uh, stare at the screen. Well, um, today I'm very happy. This is uh, my Thanksgiving gift, uh, Dr. Tuan, uh, to hear your powerful, inspirational, and motivational poem that wrap up all the story from the path from the killing field and as a refugee here in Long Beach in the United States and all resiliency and success that we come up, you know, to bounce back and be successful. I'm so proud of you as a Cambodian mother. Oh, uh, good on. Mother. Yeah, and I was a high school teacher before the war. So I, I taught uh, in the second prominent high school where you can tell in Phnom Penh until mm -hmm. the war took over. So, and I stopped my foot here as a refugee in Long Beach since so 1980. I remain here till now. I put a route, I deliver the service and then connected and get involved in the community. And I'm very touched that you say that Long Beach is different. Yes, Long Beach is special and unique mm -hmm. because I travel to a lot of uh, state and a lot of uh, places uh, to see my friend that I met in the camp. I told them that I came to visit, but I go back to my Long Beach. That's what uh, I, I stay here. So um, for 28 years, I set up an annual scholarship uh, to award the selected uh, Cambodian children that graduate from any high school in LBUSD. And they prosper, they got a higher degree, become MD, PhD, and a lot of them at least have college degree. So I would like to um, invite you to be our guest speaker for the class of 2023 um on saturday june the third now to let all those kids know that it's not the end of the world yet yeah with your strive and thrive you can make it look at you because i i work with kids yeah. 
I, I witnessed all the violence in the killing field and also in the refugee camp. And when I came in here, the kid dealing with a lot of gang violence and all those, mm -hmm. I see it all. Yeah. That's what I stepped in as a former educator to help the kid to find the solution, to find the light that they miss. Mm -hmm. And I would like you to help me uh, to give the message that you just read because my heart filled with thanks and filled with the enlightenment that you need to transfer to all those kids. And for the library folk, I would like to echo his sentiment. My kid, when we came here, we were so poor, right? I didn't speak yeah. English, but the library was a sore, especially the main library. We, we didn't have anything <laughs> during the 80s, but main library, and right now, I'm very, very grateful that to have Mount Twain Library that have also the Cambodian language public, uh, publication, a lot of book. Because right now, after 42 years in Long Beach, a lot of 1.5 generation no longer speak Khmer. Mm. Don't talk about reading or writing, but speaking. They didn't speak anymore, but I'm very grateful that to have my train library have a lot of Khmer book in there. So I'm working right now to partner with the elementary school, with the elementary school to uh, provide some Khmer class for the young children so they can get it and have a conversation with their parents and with their grandparents because grandparents cannot communicate with their kids anymore because Grandparents yeah. speak Khmer and the grandchildren speak English. So the communication is no longer there. So again, thank you so much. And thank you, Eric and Christina for making it possible. Uh, I love it. Very empowering. I'm uh, I, I would love to do it, uh, but everything has to be on Zoom. I, you know, I teach uh, uh, around that time at Union, so I could definitely do it on Zoom. Uh, and uh, oh my, the all my thing. I was a graduate <laughs> of French school, and I came here. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, in French school before, in the past. And when I came here, I learned only, I speak only thank you and hello. <laughs> and then I met one ESL <laughs> teacher that spoke French. She, in Wilson High School, she said that I waste my time in her class, stop coming to her class. And I didn't know where to go. I kept coming to her class. And then she asked the principal that she need to take time off from the class. So I had mm -hmm. to have the sub take care of her place. And she drove me to Long Beach City College. That's what she talked to somebody that I never forget him, but I never remember his name because American <laughs> name, right? Yeah. And he took care of me. Okay. Never forget me. That's what I graduated from Long Beach City College. So I'm very happy that you are the alumnus of the Long Beach City College. So we will mm. talk more. I Absolutely. graduated from Long Beach City College in mid 80s. Yeah. Uh, that's what I become who I am today. And I give back to the Long Beach City that I call home and to the community at large. Not just, I did not just so. The Cambodian children, I saw a diverse kid that need education. Absolutely. And good. That's what I'm very happy. So you can call me Om. Yeah, of course. Om. You can email on the chat. Copy it. Copy the email. Send email on your okay? Yeah, I will send email. And of course, uh, uh, you will teach on Saturday. Uh, will be in the Zoom because right now Zoom available. Technology is a very mm -hmm. um, beneficial for us. Mm -hmm. So even though I'm a dinosaur, I'm still enjoying <laughs> it. <laughs> okay, um, 
Uh, I think we're we're running out of time, but this is such a, a wonderful, enriching uh, experience, and I, I've learned a lot from from your questions. Uh, you know, so uh, thanks again, Eric, and thanks again, Alexan from, and uh, everybody else, Nancy and John and, and Robbie and all of you. I, you know, I I just I just do stuff on Facebook and Twitter, and I'm just so happy that people are responding to it uh, authentically uh, sincerely so I, I appreciate that thank you that's a great experience thank you so much and just listening to your conversation with everyone and Chan thank you also for your question and for sharing your story um this has just been such a great opportunity and you know we do have at the Mark Twain library um a really good coll extensive collection of uh, books in Kamai. So mm -hmm. definitely come and, and check it out. Uh, we're going to be having a story time next week in Kamai. So we're really excited about that. And shout out to Christina, who is the senior librarian at um, Kamai. She's also in the conversation in the chat. Welcome, Christina. Yeah. Christina and and so we're really excited you know we've been working on this together and it's just so it's such an honor to meet you and to work with you and thank you again um mr tuan for your wonderful wonderful stories absolutely keep it, keep it going. <laughs> but uh yeah i have to uh get ready to go and uh, drive back to uh, new york it's gonna be a long three and a half hour four hour drive yeah. <laughs> good with kids <laughs> all right thanks everybody take good care be safe. Thank be you very, very much. Take care, everyone. Thanks Thank for your you, Thank subscribe. You. Thank 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 you. Bye. 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 Take Bye, care. Alex. Bye, Robbie. Bye, Bye John. Bye. <laughs> Send me the link there, Eric, and I'll share it on Facebook and Twitter. Okay. You got it. And I'll email. Um, I have everyone's email too in the chat, so I'll send. I'll forward it to everyone in the chat. Yeah. As well. And um, Chan, you just send that. Give, give, uh, give, uh, Chan Hobson my email if she needs it. All right, take care, everybody. Bye. -bye. Drive safe. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Eric. Bye, bye, Chan. Thank you. Bye, bye.